I'd now like to address the whole motivation behind doing corporate venturing at all, which is the fact that sustained competitive advantage is a total myth. It may have existed for a short period of time in business history, but it has certainly not been the case over the last few decades. And I'm going to demonstrate that to you now, and then we'll talk about the implications. The premise of this course, as I just said, is that sustained competitive advantage is a myth. And one image for this may be the, the whole idea of a duck looking very calm um, as, it's, as it's swimming when you look at it from above the water, but below the water, it's rapidly um, uh, pedaling its feet to, to keep a, afloat and keep going in whatever direction it wants to go in. In fact, the situation for businesses is even more complex than what ducks deal with because in this case, the duck is still in the same pond. Uh, there, there is some predictabil predictability about its surroundings. A lot of times in the corporate world, that is not the case at all. So let me demonstrate this to you by looking at uh, the history of businesses uh, in, on the Fortune 15 list, so the top 15 companies by revenue in the U.S. On this video, you do not see the highlights of the companies that are new and old to the list, so I'm going to have to walk you through that, and every so often I may actually pick up my laptop and put it in the camera for you to see it. So let me start by pointing out that in the 1965 list, and the, the, the list actually started in 1954, so just give me a minute here while I get my, uh, my computer together. That in the 1965 list looks a lot like the 1955 list, very much dominated by industrial companies and oil and steel, and then thrown in there, you have IBM, which had close to a monopoly in its marketplace at that time, as well as AT&T, which was a monopoly at, at that time. Fast forward about 20 years to 1985, and you see a couple of companies coming onto the list and a couple of companies dropping off, like U.S. Steel drops off from, from the top 15. Um, as well as Smark, which is an industrial company, and Gulf Oil, which was, uh, which was merged. Um, but basically, the same industries stayed in, uh, in, in the Fortune 15, even 20 years later in 1985. That's important because when you think about a lot of the, the competitive strategy theories that you are used to studying, such as five forces, a lot of those were developed in the late 1970s, early 1980s, at this time of relative stability, despite some of the many issues that, that were going on that would start uh, manifesting themselves in changes in the Fortune 15 list uh, at a later point. So now, Left-hand side, 1985. Right-hand side, 2005. And there is a lot of change. So DuPont drops off. AT&T drops off because it's been broken up by, by the US government and antitrust. Amoco uh, drops off uh, at, at least for a while. Uh, it's, it's, still, it's still on the Fortune 500 list for sure. Atlantic Richfield, there's some merger activity. Shell, Chrysler drops off, um, and Marathon Oil. The interesting thing is the kinds of companies that come on to the top, the top companies by revenue. Number one, Walmart, which had gotten its start in the mid-1960s. Um, number eight, Citigroup and AIG, uh, two companies out of financial services. Um, at this point in, 19, in 2005, IBM has changed very dramatically from what it looks like uh, back uh, in the early days. So it's still up there, but it's very much re reimagined itself. And then numbers 11 through 15 are all new to the list from very different industries. So you have Hewlett-Packard. 
Berkshire Hathaway, the Warren Buffett's conglomerate, which is basically a holding company which is dominated by insurance companies. So you could think of it as another uh, financial services play. Home Depot, retail. Verizon, uh, one, one of the offshoots of AT&T. And McKesson, which uh, was a, a drug-oriented company or a healthcare-oriented company. All right, now let's go up close to the present day. The financial services companies now drop off the list because of the issues with the uh, Great Recession and too big to fail, and therefore the restructuring of those companies uh, so that there would be less potential damage to the economy um, if, they, if they did uh, um, fall apart. Um, during this time, Berkshire Hathaway has made very different kinds of acquisitions, uh, such as in uh, the railroad industry and grown a lot uh, outside of financial services, although it still is very much very active in it. But let's look at the new guys now, Apple. And in fact, Apple uh, in some lists is considered to be the, uh, the biggest company by revenue in, in the world. Um, in this particular list, it, you know, sometimes it's a little bit different depending on exactly how you count things. Our friends uh, here in Minnesota, United Health Group, is in the picture when it was not in 2005. CVS Health, so again, more health-related stuff. Um, AT&T is back, reconfigured, and imagine if they, in fact, make the acquisition they're talking about, they'll, they'll certainly be on this list and possibly even be higher. Amerisaw Spurgeon is a, a drug distribution company. And then uh, at number 15, we have um, a, a retailer, uh, Costco, as by revenue, number 15 in the US. So think about the dramatic shifts that have happened over the last 50 years, from cars, industry, oil and gas, to a tremendous mix of industries, but a big emphasis on healthcare, information, financial services, in addition to some of the more, and retail, in addition to some of the more traditional uh, um, lines of business or industries. Implication is, a lot, of, a lot of companies fell off the list. And if in fact, in fact, if you look at the first Fortune 500 list uh, from uh, either 1954 or 1955 versus today, only about 60 of those companies out of the 500 are still around. Now, that was a US perspective. Now let's look at this globally. Walmart, by revenue, is still uh, the biggest company in, in the world. Um, but the next few companies are Chinese. And, um, and then you, Royal Dutch, Dutch Shell, which is uh, Netherlands, uh, Great Britain based. Then we have Ax Exxon. Um, and then we have a couple of, uh, you know, a couple of car companies, uh, Volkswagen and Toyota, then Apple, then uh, BP, which had in, uh, incorporated Amico, then Berkshire Hathaway, and, um, and excuse me, and, and McKesson. And finally, we start moving into co uh, companies from other, corp uh, excuse me, from other countries, such as Samsung from, from Korea. So, in addition to the shifting around within U.S. industries, you also see global shifts that companies need to take into account. And this, this shows you where we stand right now in terms of where the U.S. Uh, accounts uh, for, in terms of its headquarters, in terms of company headquarters relative to the rest of the world. U.S. companies are only a little bit more than a quarter of the global Fortune 500 companies in terms of headquarters. Now, that does not uh, necessarily mean that there are some very uh, vibrant and very important uh, subsidiaries uh, here in the US um, that have a lot of autonomy. Uh, but for those of you who uh, are still thinking more from a, a, a local focus, global is really what we have to think about when we think about the overall landscape. The implication of this is what's shown in this slide. And what you see here 
is kind of a roller coaster from about 1960, 1958, um, projected into the future. But this is lifespan of a company. And this is year. And if you see back in 1960, it was a, they were about, on average, 60 years old. And then you see this kind of roller coaster effect that's, that's pretty much um, related to uh, uh, when different recessions hit. Um, but the point here is that it never comes all the way back. So here in 2015, I got to just look closely here. We're at about an average of about 18 years for companies on the Standard Poor's 500 index. That think about the trend line here. Um, obviously, things are things are going to level off at some point. But it's, a, it's an illustration of the challenges of companies even staying in business. Um, although, you know, sometimes they'll stay in business but be acquired or merged into someone else. But staying in business as an independent entity with all this change going on. The challenge here is that that makes a lot of the, the strategy advice challenging to follow. And I'll just use one example, which is uh, the book Good to Great, which was published in 2001. By Jim Collins. And what he did was he looked for long-term top performers. And he came up with 11 companies that he based this entire book and all the advice within it on. And in my mind, just 11 companies is problematic um, from a kind of from a statistical perspective. The interesting thing to think about here is, as, as, as you can recognize, about half of them ended up continuing to do well. The other half either did horrendously, like Circuit City or Fannie Mae, or you know they, they kind of kept going, but they weren't the outside success that he was arguing back in, um, back in 2001. And again, keep in mind, his emphasis was on sustained competitive advantage. So he gives great advice for, um, I think of it as uh, more uh, um, incremental maintaining your business and keeping it going. Uh, the so-called level five leadership, um, this idea of getting the right people to do the right, the, the right stuff, um, focusing in on what, from an internal perspective, the overlapping circles of where, where you make money, what you could be best at, what li so-called lights your fire, um, how the company operates somewhat on technology, but very much focused in on the core. And then finally, this idea of lots of small initiatives instead of, um, instead of taking uh, big steps. The whole, the whole issue with the good to great advice, which is great advice for operating a business day to day, is that they are focusing in on your current core businesses and then, and then growing incrementally. And um, that can have value as long as your business environment stays consistent. But that's not the case. So let's think about the many issues that come along uh, in, in the picture here. We have competition coming in and out. Um, not just here within the U.S., 
but also internationally. And also companies jumping between industries or moving up and down the value chain. Um, technological change is, as you, you know, very disruptive, and we're living through that now, uh, through first the internet and now more, more recently mobile apps and so-called internet of things. Um, sociopolitical shifts can be a big, big deal. And um, a number of industries have both started and ended as a re result of regulatory change or change in societal attitudes. The net, the net result is that organic growth can often be insufficient. And yet M&A, um, assuming that your acquisition is, is appropriately priced, um, can help you get economies of scale and move into adjacent, adjacent markets or complementarities, but it's not, it doesn't help with the big growth. And that's where new ventures come in. A focus on potentially internal startups, partnerships, uh, creating new companies in partnerships with others, and we'll be talking about several examples of that later in the course. And then finally, investments and acquisitions of new ventures not necessarily of ongoing large-scale businesses.